Okay, we are continuing our quest to find this area between the function f of x and the x-axis over the interval from a to b. And just a reminder, for this section, we're requiring that our function f of x be non-negative. I mention that just because that rule is going to change when we get to section 5.2, but we're going to have to adjust to see how we deal with having a function that takes on negative values. Okay. All right, so we have completed step one. Step one was to chop things up into little pieces. So we created a partition of the interval from A to B. We chopped the x-axis into little pieces, and that induced a chopping of the area into little strips of area. Step two, I'm going to approximate the area of each piece. So, I'm going to pick a generic piece, maybe something that looks like that. So I'm going to have something that looks kind of like so. Now, I know that the thickness here, if I've used a regular partition and we decided we would, this is just going to be delta x. Remember, that was the length of AB divided by n, because I decided to chop this up into n equal pieces. Now, if I look at that, unfortunately, that's not a geometric shape that I recognize. So I don't have a geometric formula for this. I have a very nice base here, but the height of this thing is changing because the height is determined by my function f of x, and the height is changing. Now, if the height didn't change, I'd have a rectangle. So then I would just multiply base times height. So I kind of wish the height wasn't changing. So what I'm going to recommend now is something that is an excellent tool when used judiciously in a mathematical context. It is not, as a general rule, a valuable life skill. I have a problem. The height is changing. I'm going to go into denial. I'm going to pretend the height doesn't change. I hope you are all aware of how this, in general, is not a good life strategy. But hopefully we'll see why this can be a good strategy in math, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pick a point somewhere in this interval. It can be any point I want in this interval. Common choices would be to choose the left end point or the right end point or a po the point halfway exactly in the middle, the midpoint. But it doesn't have to be. I can choose any point that I want. Now, I'm going to call that point x, i, star. Now, here's the logic behind that notation. x, because it's an x value. i, because I'm viewing this as the ith piece. Okay. So if this was the second piece, this would be x2 star. If this were the fifth piece, it would be x5 star. This is a generic piece. It's the ith piece, so it's x i star. So what does the star mean? Well, the star is there just because I've already used the symbol x i. If you remember, when we created our partition, we called the endpoints x0, x1, x2, x3, x4. And I don't want to restrict myself to having to choose an endpoint. So if I just wrote xi, that would mean the right endpoint of the ith interval. Totally fine if xi star is that, but it doesn't have to be. So the star is just to say, hey, this is not necessarily the same point that I called xi earlier. This is a potentially different point. Now, I'm going to take a look at what the height is at that particular point, And I'm going to approximate this area with the area of a rectangle that has that as a fixed height. So the base would be delta x. The height would be f evaluated at x i star. Okay. So I can then say the area of the ith piece is approximately f of x i star times delta x. That's just the height multiplied by the base. Okay. So area of a rectangle, 
height times base. Okay. So I've approximated the area of each piece. Now, the reason I wanted to chop things up into pieces before I did this is because I'm kind of hoping that if I chop things up into small pieces, the height's not going to vary too, too much. Basic principle here, if you give a function less wiggle room, it's likely to wiggle less. So if the height doesn't vary too much over this interval, then this might be a reasonable estimate. If I worked over the entire interval, a lot of functions change a whole lot over the large interval. So imagine here, if I ended up choosing my lowest point here and approximating with that height using just one rectangle, it would be a pretty lousy estimate. So I'm hoping if I chop things up into small enough pieces, the height won't vary too much, so this will be a reasonable estimate. Okay. And that's one reason that we aren't specifying ahead of time how many pieces we're chopping things into, because probably I'm going to want to use more pieces so that I get smaller pieces the more accurate I want to be. Okay, so we approximate the area of each piece. And now step three, I'm going to add them all up. So, I want to add all of these guys up, so we're going to use summation notation for that, because I might have lots of these things, and if I had a hundred rectangles that I were adding, was adding up, I don't really want to write out the first one, plus the second, plus the third, etc., etc. That gets kind of tedious. So let me remind you how summation notation works. This is a Greek letter sigma, the capital sigma. It's a symbol that means that we're going to add. So we're going to add up the stuff that comes after it. But when we're adding, we're going to take advantage of this index. We're going to have our index i is going to go from 1 to n. Start at 1 because I'm going to start with the first rectangle. Go to n because that's the number of rectangles. So when I get to the nth one, that's my last one. And what I'm going to be adding is the areas of these rectangles, which was just the height times the base. So this right here is the area of the ith rectangle, which we got by multiplying a height times a base. <laughs> and just to review, how the summation notation works here, that would be f of x1 star times delta x. That's what I get when my index is 1. Then I'm just counting until I hit n. So I'm going to add to that f of x2 star times delta x. That's what I get when my index is 2. Then I add to that what my next index is, which would be what I get when I, for the third rectangle. And I'm just going to write plus dot, 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 plus f of xn star times delta x. So basically, for each value of the index going from 1 to n, I'm going to have a term in here. Okay. Now, when I have a lot of rectangles, or when I'm holding n as a variable, so I'm not specifying ahead of times how many rectangles I have, I'm definitely going to want to use this summation notation. However, there are going to be times when we're just doing an approximation using, say, four rectangles. If I have four rectangles, I don't see any reason to do this. I would just write out first plus second plus third plus fourth. So for small numbers of rectangles, by all means, go ahead and just write out your sum by writing the individual terms. But as we start working with more and more rectangles, we're going to need this summation notation. OK. So what we have now is a very nice approximation of the entire area. We approximated each piece. When we added them all up, we get an approximation of the area. So with steps one through three, chop, approximate, add, we have that the area is approximately 
the sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of xi star times delta x. This sum actually has a name. We call it a Riemann sum. Now your textbook isn't going to introduce that notation until the next section, but we might as well have it now because that's what it is. Okay, A Riemann sum is just the sum that I get when I go through this process. So that what I'm adding up is a function, a function evaluated at a representative x value multiplied by the length of the subinterval that that x value lives in. So this is just the result of steps one through three. Okay. All right, now that's going to give me an approximation. And that's really all we're going to be doing in this particular section. We'll eventually be trying to improve on that to get the right answer. But in 5.1, we're just practicing getting through steps 1 through 3 to approximate. However, I will tell you what step 4 is. Step 4, I want to get to the exact right answer. I want to be able to replace that approximation sign with an actual equal sign. So the idea is, again, if I give the function less wiggle room, I think it's going to wiggle less. So every time I do this approximation, I'm introducing a little bit of error because the height function is actually changing. But I'm thinking if I chop things up into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, then the error should be getting less each time. Okay. So ideally what I want to do is chop things up into infinitesimally small pieces. Unfortunately, in order to do that, I would need infinitely many pieces. And I can't really quite get there. So what I want is I want the width of each piece to get really, really, really close to zero without actually getting there. Now, have we seen in this class a way of having something get really, really close to something without actually getting there? We have. It's called a limit. Okay. So I'm going to take the limit of my Riemann sum. And the exact area will equal the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of xi star times delta x. It's the limit of my Riemann sum. Now, n going to infinity means I have lots and lots of pieces. The important thing isn't that I have lots of pieces, but that they're all small. Okay. Now, if I use a regular partition, remember we said that delta x was b minus a divided by n. So if I have that, <laughs> if I have that, b minus a is a fixed number. n going to infinity is going to force that to go to zero. So as long as I use a regular partition, making n go to infinity is synonymous with making the width go to zero. If I use an irregular partition, I would have to ensure that I took the limit in such a way that not just I got lots of pieces, but I made sure that each piece, the width of every single piece, was going to zero. Okay. All right. We'll learn how to actually take that limit in the next section. This section, like I said, we're just going to practice those first three steps, chop, approximate, add to get an approximation, but I wanted you to see where we're going with that. Well, if we take the limit, it does work out that the error we're getting shrinks to zero, and so we do, in fact, get the right answer.